we don't have to be what we are. And we certainly don't have to be what we're told we are. We're constantly told we're worse people than we actually are. I mean, it's drummed into our heads all the time, the fundamental human values of selfishness and greed, um, and you're never going to change that. And it's just not true. That's because of the media. You know, we're induced yeah. to believe that, and it's just not true. It's just not the way the great majority of people are. There are some people who are like that, and we've got a name for them. They're called psychopaths. We are a society of altruists governed by psychopaths. That's our fundamental problem. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is George Mombio. George is a British environmental journalist who has had an illustrious career doing a number of things, including smuggling himself over the border uh, of Papua New Guinea into West Papua to report on the colonization by the Indonesian government long before it was international news. He is one of the pioneers of investigative environmental journalism, exposing the dispossession of peasant farmers in Brazil and land grabs in Kenya and Tanzania in the 90s. He is one of The Guardian's most popular columnists and known for his environmental and political activism alongside his writing. He is one of the only voices of reason in the United Kingdom, and for that his columns are read all over the world. He tackles capitalism, state capture, oligarchy, corporatocracy, climate corruption, and provides a systemic overview of the earth crisis, the eco-crisis. In this episode, we discuss power, how it forms, where it forms, who holds it, how they abuse it. We discuss the illusion of democracy, the proliferation of oligarchs, with George introducing me to the concept of presumed consent with regards to our democratic, quote-unquote, voting system. We talk about resources, their inequitable distribution, and the underexplored link between the fruits of colonial looting and strong social states in the post-war period. We then discuss the state of the United Kingdom and other Western democracies with regards to how they are treating climate activists, the laws they are changing, following the advice they have taken from the Atlas Network, a fossil fuel-funded collection of think tanks who have designed policies to villainize climate activists and destroy the public's capacity to protest, even to speak. We then move on to discuss social tipping points, with George explaining other social movements throughout history that seemed impossible at the time but became inevitable, before he explains his vision of the future, one of private sufficiency and public luxury. And why shouldn't we get there, he says. We may be a society of altruists governed by psychopaths, but there are more of us than there are of them. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques, and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Before we move on to today's interview, I have something very special to share with you all. To speak when words fail, and to dream when conditions are nightmarish. This is the role of art and of music in any time of crisis. I've been waiting for the climate crisis anthem, if you will, to drop for a while, hoping that someone somewhere would find a way to sing with grace and pain something that we could all join in with, something that we know to be true, not because of the words that are sung, but because of the depth of feeling beneath them. And I believe that anthem is here. A few weeks ago, I came across Louise Harris and her song, We Tried. Louise is a climate activist. She tied herself to the gantry above the M25, a motorway in the United Kingdom, to protest against government inaction on climate. Louise has given me permission to share it with you all today. This is the cry 
of the broken hearts of an abandoned generation. A song about what will happen if we don't act, if we really ran out of time to save everything that we love. Consider this song, this anthem, a call to arms, to feel the pain, the terror, the suffering, the distress of what the future really could look like, and use those feelings to motivate yourself to take action whilst we still have time. I'd quite like for the song to be Christmas number one, everybody. I think it would be an amazing opportunity to pierce the mainstream and get the climate crisis front and center in a way that isn't just on the front pages of tabloids. So I put the link in the show notes. It's available to stream everywhere. And Louise is also raising money for a climate crisis album, which you can donate to in the link below. Here is We Tried by Louise Harris. It's changing all the time And you know it ain't right Yeah, I know you think twice And love, it takes you on a ride And leaves you with no respite Well, I think I've done my time But I to the British people, not a selfish minority. We are in the fight of our lives, and we are losing. Global warming, it's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry. When the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't shining, how are people to heat their homes? But it's morally right to honour our promises. Well, maybe this was meant to be A mother wanted peace And we were not conceived
George, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Rachel. A real pleasure for me too. My first question for you is, why is the world in crisis? Well, I think the fundamental issue is that economic power has been turned into political power, that um, the people with the money have become the people with the power, and the democracy we were promised has not materialised, and instead we have the power of these special interests um, who have a, a particular interest in keeping things broadly as they are, because that's how they got their money. That's how they achieved their power from business as usual. And they don't want that to change. I mean, they might want to accelerate it. They might want to make it worse, but they don't want to make it better because that would mean ceding power. That would mean either ceding power to us as a whole, to democracy, or um, ceding power to other interests which um, might, for instance, be trying to protect the living planet. And so what we see again and again is these urgent calls for action from scientists, from activists, from everybody who understands and is concerned about these huge planetary dilemmas we face. And those call calls are just brushed aside by governments who are listening to other people altogether, the people with the money. Hmm. So governments aren't listening to people. And I suppose <laughs> a question then becomes, were governments ever listening to people. I think this is what's quite interesting about this moment in our history is it raises the question, have things gotten particularly bad or is it just that the illusion has fallen away? That is a really good question. And we suffer from something which uh, some political scientists call the folk theory of democracy. There's a, a very interesting book by um, uh, Christopher Atchin and Larry Bartles called Democracy for Realists, um, where they say, in effect, that the great majority of people possess no politically useful information whatsoever and vote on the most ridiculous and trivial of, of concerns, you know, like the way someone looks, the way someone sounds, or something which has actually got nothing to do with that particular party. It's it's about feeling, it's it's about sensation. Um, but the idea that we judge politicians by their record and we vote accordingly um, and then those politicians go on to represent us because we've chosen them to do a particular job, that has never happened. I mean, it's happened to a greater or lesser extent along a very narrow spectrum far, far away from what democracy claims to be. But democracy is and has always been a kind of dust sheet thrown over oligarchic and corporate power. Um, you, you can still see the shape of the oligarchic and corporate power underneath us, and it's a thin and fraying um, a, a semblance, uh, which is covering up something much, much bigger than itself. Um, and I think what we call democracy is actually radically ill-suited to the task it claims to address, which is the task of representing us the task of ensuring that the people control their own destiny. Um, and part of the reason for that is that society is a complex system and complex systems cannot be controlled from the center. If you try to control complex systems from the center, things are bound to go wrong. Um, and you could conceive of a democracy which did function, but it would be one based on very different principles to the thing we call democracy today. It would be run on participatory and deliberative democracy. There might be a role for representative democracy as well, but that would be secondary to the basic characteristic that the, the, the system would be run by the people themselves. And it would be far more responsive. It would be a, a far more um, engaged day-to-day -day process than the one we have at the moment. Because this thing we call democracy at the moment works, works as follows. It's... Every four or five years, you and I get an opportunity to put a cross on a piece of paper. And if we're very lucky, and I don't think it's ever happened to be once at a general election, the people we've voted for might come to form the government <laughs> uh, which claims to represent us. Um, but even if if that miraculous thing does happen, what, what have we actually voted for? We, we've voted for the entire manifesto, um, 
uh, we've either voted to accept that manifesto in its entirety or to reject that manifesto. We've also voted for everything they might choose to do for the next four or five years. Now, no one in human history has ever voted for all of those things, not least because you can't anticipate what they might choose to do for the next four or five years. In other words, this system is based on presumed consent. If you've got a majority, you presume that the nation as a whole, even including the people who didn't vote for you, consent to every single thing that you um, choose to apply from your manifesto, plus a whole lot of stuff which wasn't in the manifesto that you want to do for the next four or five years. Now, we don't accept the principle of presumed consent in sex. Why should we accept it in politics? It's a profoundly illegitimate principle. It's simply wrong. We, we, we should not accept it. And because democracy is so innately corrupt for, for these reasons that you know, it can't actually represent us, um, then it's wide open to subsidiary forms of corruption. It's wide open to the corporate lobbyists, the oligarchs, representatives, getting the ear of government rather than the people be, being heard. And again and again, what we see being passed is legislation that favours particular interest groups, particularly those that fund political parties, rather than society as a whole. I love that presumed consent. What an excellent and very clear image. And as you say, it's not something that we would accept within our social relationships. And so why would we accept it with our democratic relationships? But I suppose then it almost reveals how little the government is in relationship with its people. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that that's and, and that to an extent has always been the case. I mean, there, there is what the French call les 30 glorious, the 30 glorious years between 1945 and 1975, when in the Western world, governments were... Uh, yes, more representative of society as a whole. So in the UK during that period, we um, had the NHS introduced, we had mass council housing, we had a proper robust economic safety net created, um, the welfare state in other words. Uh, we had major investment in public services. We had the sort of public infrastructure built that we still benefit from today. And so you could say that government, um, well, those governments were closer to the people than the governments before or after. But at the global level, there is still grotesque exploitation taking place and driven often by those very governments that we look back to with such fondness. And we almost look at the history of the world at that time as if there were two completely different worlds. There was one in which you had inspiring leaders such as Clement Attlee who were um, providing us with, with with the kind of state support and public services that we all deserve. And on the other, you had this succession of appalling um, um, coups of colonial brutality, of, a, of attempts to crush independence movements. You had the overthrow of of Patrice Lumumba, of Salvador Allende, the coups in Guatemala in in. Iran, I mean, the hideous um, treatment of people in Kenya where all the Kikuyu were herded into concentration camps, uh, you know, endless atrocities all over the world. And what you can say about that period, the Trente Glorieuse, is that the, the fruits of colonial exploitation, of colonial looting, were better distributed within Western nations than they had been before. But the, the coercive relationship between the, the rich nations and the poor ones was the same as it was before. Yeah, I think that that is um, something that is quite often perhaps forgotten about when we consider the history, the, the modern history of democracy. And yes, this kind of harking back, make, make America great again, you know, or, on the, mm. or looking at the, the strength of the social state and perhaps a, a lack of... Um, awareness that those riches that were more evenly shared still came from somewhere else essentially it's very it's easy to kind of give more back to your own people um and raise your peasant class up when you're exploiting others on the other side of the world um, 
Yes, in fact, I mean, there's an argument that exploitation actually intensified during that period, mm. um, and because um, I mean, the brutality was really quite something, and it was, you know, it was the end of empire. Uh, well, mm. the end of empire as previously constituted, and so there was sort of extremely vicious attempts to sort of put independence back in its box. But it was also a a time in which the Cold War was used as an excuse for um, supporting the most horrendous dictators, proxy leaders, effectively, yeah. people who were operating on behalf of either Western interests or of Soviet interests um, and brutalizing their own populations on, on behalf of those interests. And so, so in, in, in some ways, things were even worse than they were before. Um, and and yeah, the looting machine continued, and, and I mean that is what capitalism is. Yeah. It is it is a looting machine. It's a it's it's an ever expanding frontier, grabbing resources, exploiting people, sucking the value out of them, and transferring that into the hands of more powerful people. I suppose this raises a particular uh, dilemma about where we are with regards to the climate crisis, because. One thing that is um, at the front, I think, of a lot of minds and whether or not it's the right way to go, I couldn't say, but protecting national interests, protecting national sources of energy, of food, of all of this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, simplify, uh, simplifying certain supply chains or like complexifying our supply chains by making them more diverse and thus resilient, depends which way you look at it. Um, but the sort of... <laughs> I guess the issue with that is the the history of nation state building has been so violent and so dependent upon mm. exploitation and extraction. And yet the very nature of uh, the climate crisis is the result of this coming home really to roost. Mm. Um, and so how do we go about <laughs> reforming our politics and our economy and our energy yeah. and everything in order to meet the demands of the crisis, which is what needs to happen? when the way that modern history has been built, and probably pretty ancient history as well, has been through violent extractive means. Yeah. With virtually every aspect of our economic and political organisation, you have the sense of, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> if, if we're trying to solve, solve a problem, like the existential environmental crisis, the earth systems crisis that we now face, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> but sadly... Here is where we are. But yes, you're right. I mean, the nation state itself is woefully ill-suited to this challenge. And in fact, you know, for most people um, around the world, the nation state is a very recent um, introduction. Yeah. If, if you were to wander around Europe in the middle of the 19th century and ask people which nation they belong to, most people wouldn't have a clue what, what you were talking about. Um, they they might be part of a city-state. They They might be part of a province of a wider, enormous empire. Um, but, but um, you know, there just weren't the nations that we see as set in stone today. And so many forms of our organisation, like the current form of so-called representative democracy, which really isn't anything of the kind, we, we assume that it could only be like that. That's the only way things, things could ever be. There can't be anything better than that. There are maybe some things worse than that which occurred in the past, but this this is now set in stone. And, and, and one thing that any good history of the world will show you is that there are many, many different ways to do things and many different forms of organisation um, and there are many potentials which haven't yet been explored. And, and we have an incredible capacity to do things differently, both individually and collectively, and, and yet we get stuck, we get trapped in, in a single mode. And, and that applies in, in our own lives, in, in our individual lives, just as much as it applies in the national or the international um, scope of life. Now, in Dante's Inferno, the seventh circle of hell was a place where nothing ever changed. <laughs> and he got that so right. I didn't know that. That's excellent. And one thing that certainly hasn't changed throughout um history has been the inequitable distribution of resources mm -hmm. uh, oligarchy uh, plutocracy mm -hmm. how do we what do i this comes up on the show a lot right this idea that um 
maybe there is a them and an us in terms of like a ruling class, but it's also a ruling mm. class that is driven by system dynamics. Um, and so mm. if they were to move against it, they would inherently kind of have less power. Um, but then also there does seem to be some really shadowy bunch making some really evil decisions like the Atlas Network, fossil fuel interests, funding. Yeah, yeah. tell me about yep. it. Yeah. Policy that is villainizing climate activists. Um, and so what do you think? Yeah, let's start here. What do you think about the language, first of all, of this them versus us framing? Uh, the ruling class, mm. is it helpful? Uh, should we be talking about institutions or should we be talking about names and people? This is the CEO mm. of this company. This is the, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. So so in answer to the first mm. part of that, yes, it is helpful. You know, what we have constantly is governments trying to tell us we're all in this together. In fact, that was a phrase repeatedly used by David Cameron and George Osborne, who were two of the more elite ministers we've ever suffered in this mm -hmm. country, who were definitely not in it together with us as they, as they imposed swinging austerity, horrendous cuts to public services, because it didn't matter to them because they didn't use those public services. Yeah. The people they represented didn't use those public services. About the only ones they used and only occasionally were the roads, mm. which is why so much money gets poured into roads while everything else is is staffed. But they didn't use the NHS, the National Health Service. They didn't use the Public Education Service. Um, they, they just didn't need the great majority of public services, let, let alone the welfare state, uh, because they're able to buy themselves out of that. Um, and 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 their government, just like the current one in the UK, is the perfect representation of the them and us political culture. They claim to speak on our behalf. They claim to govern on our behalf. But in reality, they do no such thing. They are um, the representatives on earth of the oligarchs and the corporations. And so we have this um, illegitimate political model which is legitimized by um, the the claim that it's mm. it, it's a form of democracy when it patently is is not unless you're talking about democracy in the weakest and thinnest of all possible senses. Now, on the question of you know should we name names? Well, yes, we definitely should. We should look at um, who are the people in particular pouring money into politics, which is perhaps the most important of all issues, you know, and we need to we, we, we need to know who those people are, what they represent and what they want. But we also need to see the the big structural picture, because as you suggest, this is something which doesn't fundamentally change. The 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 individual faces and names might change from one generation to the next, but those structures of oppression and coercion remain in place. And and so we, we need to, to know the names, but we need to be able to see beyond the names as well, to see that this is something which which is baked in to the current political model. And then having seen that and decided that that is um, a repeated feature of the model, we can then make more sensible decisions about what the alternatives might be. I think it's fairly obvious that um the kind of information that that you're sharing here isn't stuff that is widely discussed otherwise we would all be political activists or climate activists or justice activists um and there are very deliberate reasons for that including mm -hmm. you know the ruling class uh, or billionaire class oligarchs whatever you want to call them mm -hmm. also owning our our media interests yeah. um i think it's also not particularly well known at this point how much this current UK government is stripping our right to speak, our right to act, our right to protest, um, and also our right to speak about the motivations of our actions in court. I know. What is, what's happening? So at first, I thought this was peculiar to, to the UK, the introduction of these extremely repressive acts, the 2022 Police Act, the 2023 Public Order Act. These layered on top of a whole lot of previous extreme acts, like the 1986 Public Order Act, um, the 1994 Criminal Justice Act, um, and a whole load of others si since then. Um, and, 
and for a while yes they were we these were the most progressive uh, the most repressive draconian laws introduced in any oecd country in modern times to crush the life out of protest and specifically out of environmental protest but now very similar laws have been springing up all around the world and it turns out that these laws have been pushed by um, the dark money network of junk tanks, the organisations that call themselves think tanks, but there's nothing to do with thinking mm -hmm. in them at all. They're just um, lobby groups hired by billionaires and corporations. And um, and they've been pushing a, a, a template. It's, it's a corporate template for the laws they'd like to see to prevent us from challenging their destruction of the living planet. Um, and so we now see very similar laws cropping up in, in across U.S. states, being introduced at the state level, specifically by the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which was one of the groups funded by the Koch brothers, among, among others. Um, we um, see the use of the Atlas Network, who you mentioned before, which is this overarching sort of um, uh, meta junk tank set up by Anthony Fisher, the same guy who set up the Institute of Economic Affairs in the UK, um, whose purpose is to coordinate the activities of these dark money neoliberal networks. Um, and that's been introducing uh, or pushing for the introduction of very similar laws across several European countries and beyond. And so we, we see really this horrendous uh, ramping up of repression against people who are trying to challenge those who are who are destroying our life support systems, um, and and now the penalties for peacefully protesting against the destruction of the living planet have just gone off the scale. I mean, it's just got utterly ridiculous. Um, you for for peaceful protests in this country, you can get ten years in prison. Now. You know, if if you very grievously assault someone, you get less than that. This is it's it, this is the sort of legislation that you would expect to see passed in in China, or, or perhaps in Egypt. Uh, but but in a so-called democracy, well, you know, it's another sign of just how thin, how skin deep this claim to be a democracy is. When peaceful protesters, who will be seen undoubtedly in future as heroes. Uh, uh, have the book thrown at them to this extent. And, and as you say now in court, um, people are, are, are being deprived of the right to defend themselves because they can't talk about why they have taken um, the actions that they have. And so you get the most unselfish people, people who are, are trying to uh, protest against the destruction of what counts for all of us, which is a habitable planet, being treated as if they were a bunch of thugs having a ruck after after closing time, because they they can't explain why they 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 took the action that they took. So it just looks like mindless vandalism, and that's that's how the government wants it to be portrayed. It's shocking how the judiciary or parts of it have fallen into line with this and just given the government what they want. It's it's just as you know, no no proper separation of powers in this country. You know. Some, I wrote this piece a while back called, um, oh, I can't remember, <laughs> but it was about um, outrage and how we need to be careful not to be outraged at these things happening, actually, because outrage feeds the illusion that these sort of things um, are rare or un uncommon, mm -hmm. whereas actually they are very, very in keeping with executive powers consistently being abused um, by a group of, of people or ruling class that have absolutely no interest in either taking action on social justice issues, environmental issues, or on listening to the the thoughts and the demands of their people. Um, yeah. And that use of the word thugs is really good because there's just a little fact, factoid, which I want to drop in, which is unusual for me. Um, not big on facts normally, but Gail Bradbrook, who's the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, mm. um, she had a mistrial um, recently for her case of breaking um, the bank of the department for breaking the bank, breaking a window of the Department of Transport in London on October 15th, 2019 to protest against um, HS2, this big high-speed rail network that was meant to uh, dominate part of Britain's landscape, which has since been revealed uh, to have essentially been a massive fraud to the tune of about two billion. Um, her first case, her first trial 
was sent to mistrial because she spoke to the jury about her actions. She said she explained the context of the climate crisis and the judge had previously said, you're not allowed to do that. And she said, well, how am I meant to talk about this? How am I meant to talk about my motivations if I'm not allowed to talk about the climate crisis? Should I anyway, mistrial. Anyway, she came back for another trial and the judge said to her, if you do that again, I will try uh, judge you under section 46 of some act, which is reserved for members of organized crime. Jeez. Yeah. 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 Now, a nice little story. Now, I'm not sure when this um, episode will be published. The so listeners, if you're aware of the, of the delay, uh, I do apologize because I'm going to reveal what date we're publishing because this morning I was at Gail's second trial um, when she was giving her evidence to the jury. And she gave the context of the climate crisis. And the judge stopped her and 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 stopped her a bunch of times, sent the jury out, brought back in. But I was surprised at how much, you know, she was sort of being allowed to say. And he kept sort of looking at the prosecution and asking the prosecution if the prosecution wanted to do anything about what she was saying. And the prosecutor said, no, no, I'll just sort of follow you, judge. Um, and I grabbed one of the lawyers outside and I said, what's, what's going on? Why is he allowing her to talk? And he said, well, she's calling his bluff. He, it was a bullying move. He is trying yeah, to coerce yes. her into silence. He know, there's a, there was like five of us press there. The public box was also full. Mm -hmm. And she was so composed and so mm -hmm. reasonable and so gracious that he said it would, have looked, it would look absolutely awful if he threw her out, if he threw out the trial. And tried her as a member of essentially, you know, akin to a member of an organized gang. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's calling her bluff. And so far, so far, it looks like it's working. Yeah. But that's how these people are being treated. And at the same time that rapists yeah. are walking free in the UK because our jails yeah, are full. Yeah. No, it's it's just crazy, and and it's it's the same in all of these places. Like so, for instance, in Italy now, um, um, environmental protesters are being uh, having anti-mafia laws thrown. Mm -hmm. at them. They're being treated as if they're an organised crime network. We're constantly being told we're terrorists, yeah. and we have anti-terror laws thrown at us. In fact, the two thousand terrorism act has been used against environmental protesters in this country. You know when. With like the most peaceful protesters in history, yeah. it's remarkable how amazingly peaceful we have remained. Mm -hmm. And you know, every so often there's a massive media drive to try to characterise us as violent thugs, and it never works because they can't find any actual instances. Despite all the efforts by the police spies uh, working as agents provocateurs to try to get us to ramp up protests so that they become violent, it, we just innately resistant to that uh, as a movement the environmental movement does not like violence and it doesn't do violence and they're constantly trying to portray us as if we do as if we do and, and they're constantly trying to make us do it and you know you'll be very well aware of the whole spy cops scandal where you know we were comprehensively infiltrated and women were effectively raped by policemen pretending to be protesters systematically over many years and and those those police um uh, fathered children with, with with those women i mean it's it's utterly shocking and extraordinary episode in our history but we know that the undercover cops are still in our movement and they're still trying to do the same things and they're still trying to turn us into a violent movement and and it's quite extraordinary how we've resisted that it's a brilliant thing mm. but you know, it doesn't make any difference to the media and it doesn't make any difference to the government, both of whom are faithfully following the script written by the dark money junk tanks operating on behalf of the, the, the oligarchs and the corporations. And it is a script. It's, it's you know, we, we've seen now how this Atlas Network is, is pushing exactly the same story everywhere. Um, it's a story founded on lies, lies about who we are, lies about what we're trying to do. And it's a story that leads to draconian repression. Um, and, and you know, there's nothing ad hoc or accidental about this. This is a program. And we're, we're subject to that program. So, you know, the, the great courage of people like Gail um, and of the many other activists who have, who have remained resolutely nonviolent despite endless provocations, endless attempts to portray us as otherwise, and yet still remain calm and proud and still in the midst of this media storm 
is is one of the things that inspires me most. That is lovely, George. I do have to ask though, do you think there's any room for sabotage in a nonviolent movement? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I define violence as as uh, assaults on people. Right. Um, we constantly see governments and police and courts trying to define violence as assaults on property. Mm. But no, that, that's not violence. You can say it's criminal damage, but that's not the same as violence. Violence is, is hurting a person or, or, or potentially a, 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 another living animal. It's hurting something sentient which can feel pain. Um, but damage to property, yeah. I mean, in, in many cases, I believe that is justifiable, particularly when that property is being used as an instrument to cause much, much greater damage. Um, for instance, if it's an oil pipeline or, 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 or mining equipment, which is destroying our precious earth systems, um, damage which will be felt for the whole of the rest of the span of humanity's time on earth, uh, then absolutely you can commit the crime of criminal damage to prevent a far greater crime. And that's always been seen um, in um, under sensible laws mm -hmm. as 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 a as a defence, um, and um, and in many times in many cases it's it's been used successfully as, as a defence by nonviolent direct activists. Sensible laws, but we're not really being governed by those who no. interpret sensibly or rule sensibly or no. have sensible ideas. And so, no, of course. I mean, the climate, the, the environmental movement has done incredible things. And it obviously goes back from beyond uh, and before Extinction Rebellion. Um, environmental defenders have been putting their lives at risk, particularly in Latin America for, for decades, probably mm. centuries. Um, and they're still at a high risk today. Uh, people are putting their bodies on the line in Western democracies and getting jail, jail time um, and losing jobs. Even, you know, a scientist lost her job in the United States, a climate scientist, for being a member of Scientists for Rebellion. So the bravery and the compassion of these activists cannot be understated equally how they have raised the alarm and raised awareness that's all, all that data has been studied public awareness however mm. it's not actually stopping the problem right now is it because fossil fuel consumption is at an all-time high fossil fuel production is at an all-time high new oil and gas licenses granted every day even in the middle of wars um nations still manage to grant new oil and gas licenses um, the machine is nowhere near slowing down. In fact, it's ramping mm. up. Yeah. What can the movement do at this juncture? Well, the most important thing to do is to grow in this case. This is a, one of the few forms of, <laughs> of growth which is actually positive. Um, we, we just need to get a lot bigger and and in fact, we know more or less precisely how big we need to get. We need to reach 25% of the population. Um, how do we know that? Because there's Sorry? been... Yes. I beg your pardon? How do we know yeah. that? Well, there's been a, a series of, of um, uh, both observational and experimental studies showing that 25% is more or less a social tipping point. That um, If you can bring 25% of the population on board, committed to a new idea, a new way of doing things, a new perspective, then um, we see society tip. Um, and s social tipping points have been known about for a while. It's recognised that society in common with ecosystems, with banking systems, with so many other um, systems is a complex system and complex systems have tipping points. They have adaptive and emergent characteristics. They, they stabilise themselves under certain conditions of stress and then they accelerate towards a critical threshold when the stress gets beyond a certain point, and then they'll suddenly flip into a different equilibrium state. In the case of society, um, those characteristics which are innate to all such complex systems are um, um, amplified by the fact that we are the hypersocial mammals, with the possible exception of the naked mole rat. Um, we, we're constantly looking at where the social wind is blowing. Our whiskers are twitching all the time to see see which way things are going. And we don't want to be left behind. And if we perceive that the wind has changed, we tack round to catch that wind. 
And what seems to happen is that at 25%, that's the point at which we perceive the wind has changed. And so you'll get then a general social movement towards that new place. And this is how so many things that, that seemed impossible um, when we were in the thick of them suddenly changed. So, you know, if if a generation or two ago you'd asked gay, gay rights campaigners if there was a real prospect of equal marriage legislation in countries like the UK, many people would have said, well, you know, it's what we want and what we're striving for, but just look at how conservative this country is. Of course, that's not going to happen. And if you said... Do you, what, what do you think the chances of it happening under a conservative government are? <laughs> they were said, don't be ridiculous. And yet it did. I mean, it happened under one of the most appalling conservative governments we've ever suffered, which was the Cameron government, because the government had no choice. Society had changed. And it changed, not by accident. It didn't just happen. And it was because gay rights campaigners very successfully expanded and expanded the social circles, the concentric circles of consent for the new idea, for, for the new perspective, until they hit that critical thresh threshold. And it happened more or less simultaneously across Western Europe. You know, suddenly you had an acceptance of equal marriage uh, when, when it was just almost unthinkable before. And, and so what, what seems impossible becomes inevitable and it can switch between those two states very quickly, just as in other complex systems, you know, they can switch between one equilibrium state and another. We, and we've seen that happen again and again. We've seen it with smoking. Um, we've seen it with sexual liberation to a degree, but not nearly enough, obviously. We've seen it with, with women's liberation. We've seen it with um, the rights of people born out of wedlock, for instance. We never think about that today, do we? Mm -hmm. And and but by God, a hundred years ago, it was you know if you were born out of wedlock, you were just a second class citizen from the outset, you know, and you would never achieve the same status as anyone else. And 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 we don't think about it now because that's just disappeared as an issue altogether. Because again, it reached a a, a social tipping point, um, and 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 so. You know, we we see a situation which seems completely hopeless, where people say, "Well, I've got to persuade everyone." You know, my grumpy father-in-law who reads the Daily Mail, he's never going to agree to this, but he doesn't have to. I mean, he doesn't have to consciously agree to it. I mean, I, I to go back to to the marriage equality issue because I find it such an interesting one. In in that, you know, it, it was it's we've gone so far on that from this position of extreme rejection and conservatism and open homophobia right across the board you know and, and the stuff the media would say the 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 ju just the impossible social milieu for a change of that kind and then suddenly the change happens um, but I I, 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 I I know someone who who told me with a straight face of course I've always been in favor of equal marriage uh, I know for a fact he was adamantly opposed to equal <laughs> marriage. But look, if that's what he wants to believe, that's great. That's fine. It doesn't matter. You know, after the war, everyone became a member of the resistance, right? Mm. You know, you, you go around France, you don't find the Place de la Collaborateur, do you? Anywhere. It's all Place de la Resistance <laughs> everywhere in every town. Um, and, you know, if people want to believe that they were on board with this before, that's that's great. That's fine. Job done. Right, so we're looking forward to the day when everyone is retroactively uh, an environmental defender. A, but... a retroactively a member of Extinction Rebellion, yes. that's right. I was with them. Yes, I was with them. All the... I might not have sat in the street, but I was I was 100% behind them. Yeah. <laughs> but I suppose, I think uh, those are excellent points, and I love that. What, what seems impossible becomes inevitable. I suppose, though, the thing that makes this a little bit different is the complexity of the issue given we were talking about switching out a fuel source and not just switching it out but then everything having to change because the nature of the fuel source changes and because right because we can't just use renewable uh, energy to sudden to have the exact same world as before we can't just substitute mm -hmm. it um and so power seems to be very good at letting a thing happen once it's figured out how to subsume or invert that thing mm -hmm. otherly. Yeah. So marriage yeah. equality is such an interesting one because now here we are a couple of decades later and and not even a couple of decades later, but look how it's capitalized upon by corporations around the world mm. during Pride Month, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's almost as if 
yes, once power knows what to do with us, once it's got its own narrative figured out, how do we sort of explain the sanctity of the heterosexual relationship, which was kind of one way of oppressing a huge amount of people and keeping women in the home and keeping men in their, you know, men's clubs, making bad decisions about the world. <laughs> you know? yeah. but, the, but the thing with this is, and I think why they're not doing anything about the fossil fuel question is because it would change everything. You can't, I said this to um, uh, Naomi Oreskes, uh recently, and she said, well, you don't know that, but I'm going to stick with it. I, I said, to her, you, we can't have a military on renewable energy. Mm. That, no, our world no, just doesn't true. look like that. Yes, that's true. You know, this militarized, yeah. capitalist, um, inequitable, centralized economy is, is it's, it's in many respects, a, a cha it's symbiotic with fossil fuels. And yeah. so, yeah, please. And of course, this isn't, I mean, to complicate it further, this isn't just about fuel sources. Of course, mm -hmm. fuel sources is, is absolutely crucial. But, you know, we, we're facing an earth systems yeah. crisis and we've got to be very careful not to reduce it to a climate crisis. Yeah. You know, it's an ecological crisis. It's an oceans crisis. It's a forest crisis. It's a soils crisis. Yeah. It's a um, novel entities, in other words, synthetic chemicals crisis. Um, it's it's a cryosphere crisis. I mean, every every single aspect of Earth systems are in crisis. Every subsystem of the Earth system is in crisis, and it, so it's 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 a whole organizational basis which needs to change. So yes, you're right. It is of course a much much bigger ask than equal marriage, for example. Um, but I still think that we can use the amazing work that previous generations of campaigners on other issues have done um, as part of our template for 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 change and you know things can seem just impossibly enormous i mean one an, another example you know of an extraordinary tipping was the um uh, cascading collapse of the soviet union um where again it just seemed absolutely locked it seemed set in stone and that's how Many people record perceiving it, people who live within the Soviet Union. Now, this can't change. The power is so absolute and the surveillance is, is absolute and there's just no way of organising. There's no way of breaking out of this. Um, if you put a step out of line, you're going to get thrown into the Lugyanka or, 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 or sent to the Gulag and you'll never be seen again. Um, so how on earth do you change this system? And then suddenly poof, it's gone. I mean, really with extraordinary speed. Um, and that was a huge system. I mean, it dominated its part of the world absolutely. That's what we mean by a totalitarian system. Now, we live under a totalitarian system. It, it's, 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 it's a system called capital. It's an extremely effective totalitarian state. Um, in fact, it seems to me sometimes there's more dissent under regimes that we acknowledge to be totalitarian than there is under our uh, regime of supposed representative democracy. Funny I mean, that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I know. It's, it's extraordinary. It, it works very effectively. I mean, how many people in public life challenge economic growth? How many yeah. people in, in public life challenge the fact that a few people own so much while everybody else owns so little? How many people in, in, in public life challenge this extraordinary presumption in capitalism that... Um, the numbers in a person's bank account equate to the amount of natural wealth that they're allowed to own. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, how the hell does that work? Why? Where, yeah. where does that come from? But it's just yeah. soaked into us. We don't even think about it. How many people challenge capitalism? You know, you have, you have ferocious defenders of capitalism, but they don't even see what it is. You know, they, they genuinely don't know. We're just completely brainwashed and and. Pe very few people are prepared to dissent. You know, there are dissenters, uh, but somehow this combination of, you know, fairly draconian laws, not as draconian as in totalitarian regimes. I mean, let's let, let's be honest about this, but still pretty horrendous. Um, ambition and the curtailment of ambition. You know, if, you can't. Your career will not progress. You will not have a career if 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 you step out of line. Um, and the sort of force of social conformity reinforced so much by the media, which is um, generally dominated by 
offshore billionaires, people who don't even bloody live in this country, but still tell us how to vote and how to think. Um, um, th this combination is extremely effective at making sure that we don't step out of line. So in some ways, we're in a very similar system to the Soviet Union, except you know we don't all immediately get thrown at, at, in, into prison for dissenting. We don't have to be, because on the whole, we don't dissent. And so it, it can feel just as locked in as that system was, but it's potentially just as fragile. I mean, after all, you know, we are many, they are few. We, we've got you know, a very small number of people who benefit from business as usual, and it's shrinking with every year that passes. As the whole planet gets used as a sacrifice zone, as, as capitalism exploits people more and more and more in, in, in ever more extreme ways, um, fewer and fewer people are benefiting from this. I mean, the true beneficiaries number in the hundreds, you know, the people who really yeah. uh, basically make the system run as they want it to run and and get exactly the results they want. That, they number in the hundreds, they're tiny numbers of people. And sure, the faces change, but it's it's that tiny group of people who needs to be overthrown. This is not a massive task any more than the overthrow of, of the power system in the Soviet Union was. Obviously, they are massive tasks, but they're not. It, it, it's not a bigger task, and it's not a more impossible task than that. And and I think what we've got in our favour, if we can only articulate it as such, is is a potential for a very positive and inspiring vision of an ecological civilization. Um, and you know, there are many people who are, I believe have brought forward elements of that vision. Um, Jeremy Lent with his fantastic writing in the Patterning Instinct, Kate Rayworth with with. Donut economics. Many other people are putting in places. I'd, I'd, um, I, I, I'd like to see part of it being part of this vision. This uh, thing I call private sufficiency, public luxury. The idea that um, we can't all aspire to private luxury. There's just not enough ecological space. There's not even enough physical space. Um, some people can enjoy public luxury today only because other people can't. A, because they're exploiting yeah. those other people. That's where the luxury comes from, is from the exploitation of other people. But B, because you know, if everyone in London had their own swimming pool and their own tennis court and their own art collection, London would cover half of England. England would cover yeah. the whole of Europe. You know, There's just literally yeah. not space for it, let alone ecological space. You would cook the planet in minutes if everybody tried to have their super yacht and their, their super homes and their uh, private jet and all the other things that the yeah. billionaires have. But we can all aspire to public luxury. We can have magnificent public art galleries and public parks and public swimming pools and public tennis courts and public health services and public transport <laughs> systems and the rest of it. And those don't take space away from anyone. Uh, they, 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 by sharing resources, we make them go much, much further. And we don't push people out, we bring people in. So private sufficiency, you know, we all have our own modest homes and 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 our modest stuff within those homes. But if we want luxury, we pursue the luxury in 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 the public domain. And so I feel by bringing together ideas like this, you know, lots of different amazing thinkers, you know, we create a picture of an ecological civilization which can become very attractive. But obviously, a big part of that picture is is a, the question of power. Is, is who's in charge, who controls things, who makes decisions. And the obvious and only answer is we do. And again, there are templates, uh, there are precedents for this. So the participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre, this uh, city in southern Brazil, um, between 1989 and 2004, where really the people were in charge of the budget and they completely transformed the city as a result. I mean, 50,000 people every year would come together to decide how that money was going to be spent. And it went from being at the bottom or towards the bottom of the Human Development Index in Brazil to the city at the top of the Human Development Index. Massive improvements in maternal mortality stats, infant yeah. mortality, in primary health care, in primary education, in sewerage, in clean water, in public transport, you name it. I mean, to the extent that something that any political scientist would tell you was impossible happened, that um, people took to the streets to demonstrate in order to have their taxes raised. They demonstrated in favour of higher taxes. 
because they realized that if they spent their money together, it went a lot further than if they tried to sp spend it individually. Oh, I love people. You just hear stories all the time of people being phenomenal and people knowing what they need. I mean, this is the thing about the world that we live in. It's so infantilizing no. and it's so destructive to say that people possibly couldn't possibly govern themselves. They've been, we've been governing ourselves for a bloody long time, yeah, thank yeah, you very yeah. much, up until these like massive modern institutions. We don't have to be what we are. And we certainly don't have to be what we're told we are. We're constantly told we're worse people than we actually are. I mean, it's drummed into our heads all the time, the fundamental human values of selfishness and greed, um, and you're never going to change that. And it's just not true. I mean, there's good science in this, loads of it, across social science, anthropology, neuroscience. Those are not our fundamental values. Sure, we've all got some selfishness and greed in us, but they're way down the list, up top, is like family, community, um, belonging, benevolence, um, altruism, empathy, wanting a world that's good not just for us but for other people as well. And people have this, yeah. sort of, this really weird view of human nature because if you say to, to, to someone, you know, what do you want to see happen? What sort of world do you want to live in? They'll, they'll give you, you know, a, a nice vision of the world, a world that's good for everyone. But if you say to them, what sort of world do other people want to live in? They say, ah, oh, selfishness and greed, fighting like stray dogs over a dustbin. You know, and, and that's that's because of the media. You know, we're induced yeah. to believe that. And it's just not true. It's just not the way the great majority of people are. There are some people who are like that. And we've got a name for them. They're called psychopaths. We are a society of altruists governed by psychopaths. That's our fundamental problem. Oh, I love that. I have uh, one more question for you before we wrap up, because I'm aware of the time. Um, and it's a bit of a cheeky question. Now, we haven't spoken about food at all during this episode. And I know that um, a lot of my listeners will be disappointed in me for not <laughs> directing us there. It's because um, I don't really understand kilowatt hours and that <laughs> kind of thing. So I have a proposition for you. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Nikki Yoxel a few months ago um, on regenerative farming, and she ha does pasture, grass-fed beef up in the north of Scotland. And she would love to have a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. um, be, to to ha yeah, have a conversation around these differences that are coming out in opinion about what the future of food could look like. And I said that during our interview, I would ask you <laughs> if um, you'd be interested in having a moderated conversation with Nikki around this because to me it seems like such a shame that people who obviously share fantastic intentions have very very different opinions on what the future of food could look like and it's so critical mm -hmm. to understand um and I'm fairly au fait with you know the eco crisis as a whole but this is something that is very complex so yes George would you be yeah. interested uh, well, in principle, yeah, the question is always time. I mean, I'm just so yeah. up against it all the time. Yeah. It's just, I'm sure you, you know how it is. It's just running, yeah. running, running. And then you, you realize you haven't tied your shoelaces and you fall flat in your face. So, um, yes. um, but yeah, in, in principle, I'd love to. And, and I, you know, I've had quite a few discussions now with uh, people, farmers, other people in the food sector, you know, with whom I radically disagree about about that future and these are very important conversations to to have so uh well let's see if we can make it happen but i'm not going to promise anything Great. at this stage of course thank you very much and my final question for you is who would you like to platform all right i would like to nominate though i haven't asked her permission um, um, a remarkable activist and thinker called emma smart who um has served time in prison um for her um, climate activism uh, but has also had an amazing history. I mean, really an extraordinary history of, um, of, of just fighting for the natural world by every nonviolent means possible in lots and lots of different roles and guises. So, so um, I think she'd be an amazing person to interview if she would be up for it. Wonderful. George, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Rachel. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it.
To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com, where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.